and a little bit of that. Okay. So guys, this is what I'd like to use as sort of our re-engaging point relative to the concepts that we covered last time. We laid out some terminology that we're going to need to be able to draw on throughout the rest of this conversation. So guys, let's go back and talk about the idea of reversibility, irreversibility, and what that has to do with spontaneity. Because guys, remember the big idea for chapter 19 and really the big idea for thermo as it applies to AP chemistry is all about spontaneity. So we're not ready to really answer the spontaneity question yet. We'll do that next week. But guys, let's have this conversation now. So what does it mean that a reaction is reversible? And guys, you gotta be careful here because the misconception is you think it simply means can go both directions. Guys, understand any reaction can bo go both directions, even the egg. Remember we talked about the idea that we drop the egg, it goes this way. Could it go the other way? Yeah, but it's gonna take a lot of work. So guys, any process technically is reversible. That's not what this means. So what does reversible mean? Goes both ways at the same time with no net change to the system or the surroundings. And what do we call that unique set of circumstances? Equilibrium. So guys, the idea here is that reversible means it goes both directions simultaneously and we call those conditions equilibrium. Is that okay? Now, irreversible. This is important because irreversible means it can't go backwards through the same pathway. Now guys, understand that it can go backwards, but it goes backwards through a different process. And so guys, when we talk about irreversible reactions, here's the idea. It has a direction that it always goes, and it has a direction that it never goes. You okay with that idea? Now guys, what do we call the direction that it always goes? That's the spontaneous direction, and that's the connection. So guys, if we have a reaction that is spontaneous, it is irreversible. So it has a direction that it always goes all on its own, and it has a direction that it never goes on its own, although it can be forced. So guys, let's call time out. What do you need to talk about? You guys okay with these concepts? Yeah. Question. Yep. Uh, what about like the surroundings, like temperature? Mm-hmm. Okay. Take a cake, for example. Okay. And I like cake. <laughs> and you're going to bake it? Yes. So if the cake is like your system, then you... Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah. And then you put it in the oven, and the oven's hot. <laughs> yes. And like, does that mean that you're changing it, or is it what happens spontaneously? Does that make sense? It does, except, well, no, it doesn't. Because, so, so what is the process that we're studying? Cake? unbaked cake turning into baked cake? Okay, so if that's, I don't know if that's really what you mean, but, but in order to talk about tying whatever we're thinking about into spontaneity and reversibility, we have to clearly define what's the process. So, well, don't think about cake, then just any, I don't know, any reaction. I want to think about cake. <laughs> I like, okay. Okay. well, but no, but let's, let's, let's finish this before we switch to something else. So, so if the process is batter turning into cake, is that spontaneous? And the answer is no. If you set batter on the counter, you're, you can wait forever and it'll never bake itself. So you've got to put it in the oven and the oven would be the part of the surroundings that we're concerned about. And the oven is adding energy to the batter through heat, not work, but heat. And that's baking the cake and turning it into edible cake. So batter turning into cake is not spontaneous because it doesn't happen on its own. Okay, so then with the idea of cake, okay. you couldn't turn that back into what it was before, but is that just because you added so much energy that it would just take the same amount of energy to turn back into what it was before? Okay, so, so now we're talking about the idea of reversibility. And so the idea is that we can turn batter into cake. Can we also turn cake into batter? And the answer is theoretically, yeah. 
um, it's really hard to do and it takes a lot of work and it wouldn't just involve removing heat. You can't, when you take a cake and cool it down, it doesn't turn into batter, right? Right, yeah. Right, but so, but in theory, the amount of energy would have to be the same. It's just through a different pathway because we'd have to do work. So it's irrevert. So yeah. So it, it's irreversible because it doesn't have a direction that it goes on its own in either direction. So that would make it irreverse. Oh, I see what you're saying. So this is something that just doesn't happen at all without outside intervention. Oh, I see where you're going with that. So this process doesn't have a spontaneous direction. It just doesn't happen. Um, so we wouldn't even include it in this conversation because it doesn't go forward or backward. Cake doesn't naturally, batter doesn't naturally turn into cake. Cake doesn't naturally turn into batter. Neither of those processes happen on its own, so certainly it's not spontaneous. Is that okay? Yeah. Correct. And so... Yeah, and so that's the reason why I'm balking a little bit because, and, and it does apply, right? Because now we need to talk about temperature and environment because cake does, batter does spontaneously turn into cake at a high enough temperature, but now we need to bring temperature into the conversation, which we're not ready to do yet because we haven't talked about Gibbs free energy. But you're absolutely right, Josh, that does make the connection. So maybe what we should do is table forgive me, but table the cake conversation until we bring in temperature, because what we're going to do in, in two class periods, because Josh, you're absolutely right, that when we bring temperature into the conversation, we will find that there are temperature thresholds. And sometimes above, sometimes below, for cake it's above, above a temperature threshold, um, batter turns into cake, cake never turns into batter. Okay. And so then we would consider that to be, to be spontaneous, but it's at only at temperatures above certainly room temperature because cakes don't bake at room temperature. But when we start talking about Gibbs free energy, as Josh brought up, then we can start talking about spontaneity being contextual based upon temperature. But we can't do that until we fully talk about entropy because it's actually the entropy factor where temperature comes into play. So we'll get there to sort it today, but more next week. Is that okay? Guys, anything else about reversibility? Yeah. What's like another example of a reversible process that isn't like ice melting? So, I mean, we can talk about all. So, um, acetic acid breaking down into water, um, CH3COOH, right? And so. So, and we, I, we've drawn this a couple times sort of schematically, but we've got CH3COOH, when that goes into water, it breaks into acetate ion and protons. But we talked about the idea that the thing that makes acetic acid a weak acid is the fact that all the while it's breaking apart, it's also reforming. And so that would be an example of a reversible process because it's going forward and backward through the same pathway. The energy changes are equal and so there's no net change to the system or the surroundings. There's always a fixed amount of each one of these things, unprotonated acid, acetate ion, and protons. So anytime we've got a system at equilibrium, that would be a reversible process. Um, it could be a nitrogen and hydrogen forming ammonia. It could, anything that's at equilibrium. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so any weak acid in water is understood. Let me say it this way. The protonation of any weak acid in water is understood to be a reversible process. Yeah, great connection. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That's a good question. I, let me think about it. Can we define spontaneous direction yes. right now? Usually you have like an official one that you have up on the board. Yeah, a definite, right. Down yeah, so, what, so we could say this. This could be our definition of a spontaneous direction because the spontaneous direction, oh, and it's actually right here, is the spontaneous process. So the spontaneous direction is the direction the reaction goes on its own. 
without outside intervention. And then the opposite direction is the non-spontaneous direction and it never goes that direction without outside influence. Okay, another question. Mm -hmm. So since sulfuric acid is diphotic, but since it completely pronates mm -hmm. except for one exception, would that be in a sense a reversible process as well? It would be both. Well, it depends on what you're looking at. So if you put sulfuric acid in water, the first protonation is irreversible. It goes to completion, right? That would make it spontaneous. Then the second protonation, when that second hydrogen comes off, that would be reversible and therefore not spontaneous because it, it goes both directions at once. It does both, yeah. Abs and so then again, kind of like the cake idea, it depends on which process we're looking at. The first protonation is spontaneous, the second is not because it's at equilibrium. Yeah. You guys good? Are we okay? You really okay? Caleb, you ready for microstates? Here we go. All right. So guys, we are ready to roll. So let me find the slide that we need to jump down to. And here we go. So guys, this is going to be the connection and the thing that we are going to do to answer the day's big idea. So guys, what's the problem with quick cold packs? They're spontaneous and endothermic, right? So guys, let's bring you back to the problem if you don't remember the problem. We said early on on Monday that any process that happens on its own spontaneous, right? Any process that is spontaneous releases energy. Let that soak in. You're okay with that? Balls roll downhill, whatever it is. Any process that happens spontaneously releases energy. Good? Okay. So why was this a problem? Because this happens on its own and it takes in energy. And so then we said, oh my gosh, is this a violation of the concept that it has to release energy? And we said, no, it's not a violation of the concept. It's just that our understanding of energy is too narrow. Are you with me to there? Because we are about to expand our horizons. Ready? Here we go. So guys, none of you have a hard time when you think about energy, thinking about balls rolling downhill and losing energy. None of you, I think, when you think about energy being released, can, can, would struggle with picturing a Bunsen burner giving off heat, right, energy exchange through heat, to the surroundings. Guys, now you've got to wrap your head around this. In the same way that balls rolling downhill release energy, in the same way that Bunsen burners releasing heat into the environment releases energy, guys, there's another kind of energy that drives processes, and it's randomness. You're going to want to include this in your notes. Guys, randomness is another driving force, it's not really a force, that's why I don't teach physics, another driving force in the universe. It's the only word I got. So how does this work? Well, guys, you're going to find out in a minute, that's why this works. But in order for that to make sense, we've got to talk about randomness. So guys, here's the idea. Many of you drew this in your chapter 19 summary underneath diagrams, which I think was very appropriate. If you want to scratch this quickly, I can slow down enough to let you do that. So guys, let me tell you a little bit about this system. Bless you. What we have here, oh, that shouldn't be blue. Pretend like that's not blue. We're leaking apparently. Can I make that not blue? See if I can make that not blue. Oh, I don't want to separate it. Let's don't. Hi. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, yep. Thank you. you. Got it. All right. So guys, again, that's not supposed to be blue, but this is the idea. Over in the right-hand side of this system, we have a gas trapped, and this is important, in a solid container. Picture a propane tank 
right? A propane tank can be full, a propane tank can be empty. It doesn't collapse, it doesn't squeeze, it is rigid, okay? Then over here we have an empty, if you will, propane tank, and then they are connected by a tube or a hose with a valve in it. Now guys, what are the molecules doing in the right-hand tank? Going crazy, hundreds of miles an hour. Whatever you picture for a gas, it's going nuts inside of there. Now guys, what's going on in the left-hand side? Nothing, because there's no gas in there. Now, when we open up the valve, what is going to happen? So this gas is going to go, it's going to expand into the empty container. Now guys, it's critical that you understand why. So when we pull out the valve, it does this. But guys, here's the thing you've got to understand. I'll let you draw it and then we'll talk. The thing you've got to understand is why does this happen? But I'll let you draw and then we'll talk about why this happens. So guys, why does this happen? Well, first of all, let's talk about the reason, the reasons, the, the, the wrong understandings, not the reasons it doesn't happen. This is not why it happens. Does this canister squeeze and push the gas over there? No, it's rigid. It doesn't have to squeeze to get the gas to go. So work is not being done on the gas. Do we have to heat this gas up to get it to go over there? No. So the surroundings do not have to do anything to the gas. No work through squeezing, no heating through heating. The gas does this all by itself. Guys, the question is why? Why does this gas spread out into the other container and eventually, very quickly, we end up with equal amounts of gas on both sides? Why does that happen? There's a one word answer randomness. Guys, it's all about disorder. And now you've got to wrap your head around this. And there are multiple ways that we can understand this, but let me see if I can help you understand it on a molecular level. You ready? What are these molecules inside this side doing right now when it's closed? They're bouncing into stuff. Now guys, watch. What are the three things that they're bouncing into? Each other? the container and the valve. Now, when we get rid of the valve, the molecules that would have crashed into the valve no longer crash into the valve. What do they do? Go into the other container. So guys, because their movement is random, the law of averages would tell us that eventually we are going to have enough molecules that would have collided with the valve, but because there was no valve, they traveled into the other container. Now, is this a one directional process? And the answer is no, because these molecules are moving around and all the ones of these that would have hit the valve, what do they do? They go in the other direction, and eventually, if we have enough particles moving fast enough through random paths, eventually we've got molecules moving in both directions at equal rates, and we end up with the gases evenly distributed throughout the, th the two containers. Okay, now guys, let's talk about randomness. Which one is more random? And this is where microstates come in. Well, guys, which one is more random? Is it more random to have this gas in this small space or to have the same amount of gas spread throughout a larger space? And guys, the answer is spread throughout the larger space. So now we need to talk about ran what randomness really is. You ready? Here's the scientific definition of randomness increased choices. Guys, randomness is a measure of possible organizations. Randomness is a measure of increased choices. Now guys, let me show you what I'm talking about 
with the idea that this could really trip up my computer. So guys, it goes like this. You may want to draw this with me. We'll do it sort of hurriedly. Draw this thing. Oh, that's too big. Draw this thing four times. Good heavens. I'm seldom surprised at just how bad my penmanship is. Okay, so guys, here's what we're going to do. Inside our previous example that you drew in your notes, there was an atmosphere of gas in there. There was, if it, so if it was one atmosphere and if that was one mole, 22.4, there's a lot of gas molecules in there. But guys, for you to understand this idea of choice and arrangement and randomness, let's simplify our system. Say that we have two gas molecules. You ready? So this is what our system looked like originally. Those gas molecules had no choice. They were in one place and only one place because there was a valve. So if you'd like to draw in the valve, you could certainly do that. So we add this. Now, when we open the valve, we opened up the possibility of more choices. So what are now, with the valve open, the ways these gas molecules could be distributed? Well, we could have one here and one there. Now, what are the other ways these things could be organized? They could both, well, they could both be here, but they could also be one there and whoa, and one here. So now you're going, what on earth is he talking about? Well, guys, this is the idea. Let's give them numbers. This is number one and this is number two. This is number one and this is number two. This is number two and this is number one. This is number one and this is number two. So even though they're the same type of gas, they're not the same particles. So now guys, let's talk about some fractions. Once we, and then guys, even we could say this, is there the possibility with the valve open they could be like this? Yeah, so let's pull out the valve and let's really talk. Oh, there it went. You knew it was coming. And I have no idea why it did that. Okay, probably going to start ghosting. But guys, here's the idea. Even with the valve open, there is the possibility that they could be arranged like this. So now let's talk about how often they will be in these configurations. Well, guys, they will be in these configurations a fourth of the time. If this is truly random, they will be in each of these configurations a fourth of the time. But do you get the idea? These look the same. If we don't keep track of which molecule is where, this and this are functionally the same because we've got half the gas in both vessels, so they're really like this half the time. Now, guys, if you're really feeling adventurous, add another particle and do it all over again. And what you will find is that with each increasing particle that you add to the system, especially if you're adding even numbers. But guys, with each particle that you add to the system, you will find that a greater fraction of the time do they exist like this, and a smaller fraction of the time do they exist in lopsided arrangements. Now, if you increase the number of particles to moles of particles, 
Now all of a sudden the averages start to really get lopsided and they spend functionally all of their time like this and none of their time like this because if you add 602 septillion particles, the chance of them being all in one or the other container is functionally zero and the chances of 602 septillion particles being split evenly between the two almost becomes all the time. Do you get the idea? So guys, just a second. So that's the idea behind microstates and randomness. When we think about randomness, we can understand it as just randomly things want to spread out evenly, but it's really a function of choice and organization where the law of averages simply says that most of the time particles will be spread out at the greatest distributions. Just a second, go ahead. What are you graphing on your normal curve? Oh, so you're saying the peak of your normal curve would be even distribution, would be 50-50? I don't think it would be normal. I could, I've never thought about it. I don't think it would be normal because normal would seem to indicate that it's only there for that very short span of time where I mean, maybe it would be normal because on either side of normal, even though it's not perfectly 50-50, it's close enough when we're talking about enough particles that it looks the same. I honestly don't know, Caleb. I'm not sure. Yeah, it would be interesting to try to pose that question to Gil. Um, yeah, but you'd have to go back and talk with him about microstates and randomness. But if you could go back and do that, it would be interesting to know what he says. I'm frankly not sure. It's a great question. Go ahead. Yeah. Each, yeah, and understand microstate is not a part of the AP curricula. You'll never be asked about microstates. But in order to really understand why randomness drives processes, we understand it through the lens of what we call microstates. But if you can simply wrap your head around the idea that what we're really talking about is, is distribution of choices. And when we get enough particles, it starts to be self-limiting to the point where the lopsidedness isn't favored and the even distributions just by averages are favored. So is that okay? You guys good? Okay. Now guys, here's the thing you got to understand. We don't have to do anything to make this happen. And this is not just true of gases trapped inside of containers. Guys, this is a very real driving influence that causes processes to happen. So you're going to find out that not only does it explain why gases evenly distribute through containers, it explains why a lot of things happen that we don't otherwise understand why they would happen, like quick cold packs. Guys, this is why quick cold packs work. They work because as the process, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, as the process in the quick cold pack is taking place, we are ending up with greater and greater degrees of randomness, which is the driving force that causes the process to happen. So with that said, let's put a little finer point on randomness. Hey, that's not even ghosting. Right on. All right. So guys, this then is the way that this goes. I don't know that you need to write this down, but it's important for you to understand this, that if this works, and it does, this happens isothermally, which means no change in temperature. And so guys, the idea is that this process is spontaneous. So why is it spontaneous? Because of randomness. So guys, what about randomness? Well, here we go. We don't use the word randomness. We use the word entropy. So what is entropy? Well, entropy is randomness. It is increasing randomness. But guys, the word that we will use is disorder. And this is critical. Never, ever, ever think of entropy as order. You just got to get that out of your head. So 
So guys, let me show you what I'm talking about. If we go back to this idea and we understand that the gas is spreading out, is that an increase in disorder or a decrease in order? It's an increase in disorder. Why is it dangerous to think of it as a decrease in order? Because then our signs are wrong. You get the idea? An increase in disorder is positive. A decrease in order is negative. And the signs matter. So guys, in order to get the signage correct, we have got to think of entropy as disorder. Okay, so with that said then, we, we abbreviate entropy S. And to make the connection then with disorder, the more disordered or random a system, the larger the entropy of the system. So guys, let's do this mentally. When you picture an ordered system, what do you see in your head? What does it look like? What does an ordered system look like? Say it again. Your mom's room. <laughs> this is actually not a bad analogy. It's my room versus my son. Actually, my daughter's room is horrible. But yeah, so when you pick something that's ordered, everything's in its place. Things aren't scattered around. Things are stacked up in order. So what does disordered look like? Good night, right? Like all over the stinking place. For those of you that had Mr. Miller last year, it's kind of like the difference between my classroom and his classroom. <laughs> Miller was heavy into disorder. But guys, when we think about this relative to chemistry, let me introduce you to order. Guys, these are all highly ordered systems. And what are they all? Solids. Diamond, graphite, ice, and table salt. These are all highly ordered systems. So let's talk about why. Let's talk about table salt. Guys, do these ions have much choice in terms of where they go? No. They are locked in stinking place. They ain't got no choices. They ain't got no microstates. They're locked in. So guys, by definition, solids have very low disorders. So in a solid, if they are in fact locked in place, and they are, does that mean they have zero disorder? No. How come? They're wiggling. So while they can't actually change location, relative to each other, they can wiggle. And so this is where temperature comes in, right? When we think about temperature and things, guys, that temperature, the higher the temperature, the more they wiggle, the more the disorder, right? So hot things have higher entropies than cold things, and solids have more entropy than liquids. But what about gases? More entropy than liquids and solids. So guys, entropy is highly dependent on phase. Solids have low entropies, liquids have more, gases have much more, and then also on temperature. Yeah. Yes, and so thankfully we don't have to run down that rat trail. Um, we, and, and wait until you take PCAM you're going to want to die because there are ways of quantifying, measuring, um, not just microstate options based upon gross positioning, but also based upon vibrational energy. You can quantify that and tie it to entropy. Um, the calculus of it is a little funky. Um, and frankly, I've repressed a lot of those memories. But um, you can do it. It's not necessary here. Guys, again, the, we're going to be held accountable for this qualitatively. And so the qualitative portion of this is solids have low entropies, then liquids, then gases, and then entropy changes with temperature 
temperature. And so the warmer something is, the greater its entropy. That's the extent at which we need to know it. Go ahead. Yeah. No, here's the thing that's interesting. We can measure it. Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's an indirect measurement. We don't have a disorder meter. But if we know the structure of the substance, and if we know its temperature, and if we know things like its mass and its, its vibrational freedom and things like that, we can quantify entropy. And guys, this is going to be important in just a minute, so please hear this. Guys, understand, remember when we did heats of formation? And we said that the heats of formation for elements was zero because they form spontaneously. Even elements have disorder. And I know that kind of makes sense, but it makes the math a little different because while we don't attribute heats of formation to, ele to elements, we do attribute entropies to elements. And we'll do that in just a minute. Spencer, you had a question. Yes. Absolutely. So solid salt has low disorder. And notice we're always saying disorder and not order. This has low disorder. When salt melts, not dissolves, that's different, right? But when salt melts, its disorder goes up. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. So do water elements have disorder because of their the electrons? Is that why is there moving around those? Yeah, we can actually it's crazy. I went to a conference that sort of talked about this a little bit. And you, you can talk about the, the stress, the tension, the entropy actually caused by the opposing spin of electrons. Yeah, absolutely. You can talk about angular momentum and how that attributes to entropy. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. So yeah. Probably, but understand again, we are not going to deal with entropy at that fine a level. We're going to deal with it at a more macro scale level. So we'll deal with it first of all in terms of solids, liquids, gases, and then we'll also deal with it in terms of change. Okay, so guys, all great questions. Let me do this to kind of, um, to kind of bring this together for you because I understand you're processing and you're like, what if, what if, what if? Guys, let me, let me, we're going to talk about entropy now through kind of an interesting process. So I need to escape out of this and we're going to have a little entropy conversation relative to this video. So Spencer, just a second ago, talked about the idea of molten salt. And you understand molten means melted, right? So we're talking about taking salt and melting it. That is not what we're looking at here. But guys, we're going, I'm just going to shut off the sound. We don't need it. Um, here's what we're, have you guys seen this video before? You're going to love it. We're going to watch this video like 1,100 times in this class. I'm convinced that you could actually teach a really solid chemistry course just based upon how salt dissolves in water. So guys, this is how salt dissolves in water. We understand that these water molecules are polar. We understand that these water molecules through intermolecular forces are attracting the ions in the salt lattice. Those intermolecular forces are strong enough to overcome the ionic bonds in the salt. The water molecules carry off the salt ions. They surround the salt ions. And that's what it looks like. Well, let me bring it back. And this then is what it looks like inside a salt solution as the water molecules surround the salt ions. You got the idea? The, well, the sodium and chloride ions. You okay? Okay. Now, guys, let's do this. Let's go back here and let's kind of hit the reset button and let's have this conversation relative, and I'll do this in red. I think it'll stand out. Let's have this conversation relative to uh, entropy. So, guys, what do you know about the entropy of this? High or low? Low, right? Solids, especially crystalline solids, have fairly low entropies. So now let's bring in, and this is going to zoom in, I think. Yeah. So now let's bring in some water. So now, guys, 
here we have a part of our system that is very ordered, right? Now, guys, watch the salt as it dissolves and ask yourself this question. What is happening to entropy? What is happening to the entropy of the salt as it dissolves? Why is it increasing? What's happening to these ions that causes entropy to go up? They're moving, which gives them more options. As they get more options, entropy goes up. Now guys, if you don't like this idea of microstates, and as Jared got his thinking, it's not part of our curricula. Guys, if you don't like microstates, if nothing else, can't you just be comfortable with the idea that if a salt crystal has a high entropy, as the ions fly off into solution, that's more disordered? Is that okay? Okay. Because now, guys, i got to throw a curveball at you. I would suggest to you that what you are seeing right now on this video... Nathan, you're up here, buddy. Come here. Come here. You are proving incapable of surviving back there, both in lab and in class. So, guys, I would propose to you, guys, that this process that you're seeing on the board actually represents a decrease in entropy. Uh-oh. You just said it's an increase in entropy. I would propose to you it's a decrease in entropy. Talk about the water, Vanessa. Aha. How come? Let's, let's clear up the mess. Yeah, so let's clean up the mess. So guys, right now, right now, before the water interacts with the salt, this water's got all sorts of options. It's, remember, like a mosh pit. This water's flying all over the place, doing its water stuff. Water is a very chaotic system. It has a high entropy. But guys, what happens to the water molecules, as Spencer said, as the intermolecular forces cause the water molecules to attract themselves to the ions? Let me show you the final picture and then you'll see it. Here it comes. There you go. What happened to the water's entropy? Went down. Guys, water don't look like this when there ain't no salt. Right? Water does not organize itself into these pretty little clusters when there's no salt in the water. So adding salt and water together certainly did increase the entropy of the salt, but what did it do to the entropy of the water? It went down. Now, guys, here's the question. Which is greater, the increase in entropy for the salt or the decrease in entropy for the water? The increase for the entropy of the salt. How do we know? Because it happened. Guys, there's a driving principle in the universe that says this. Any process that happens causes an increase in entropy in the universe. Doesn't have to be the system, but in the universe. So I know you're writing it down. It's actually in our notes. Guys, let me show you. <laughs> Someone's erasing okay here we go so guys the take home message with this is that it's not enough for us to just look at the disorder of the salt we've got to talk about the disorder of everything okay and when we do we now get into the second law of thermodynamics again google this at your own risk But guys, it goes like this. The second law of thermodynamics says this. And it, this isn't the definition. We're getting to it. But the idea is this. Unlike enthalpy, when we consider the entropy of a system, we've got to consider both the system and the surroundings. So 
So when we think about disorder, guys, we can't think about this just by looking at the system. We've got to consider the system and the surroundings. And that has a name. It's called the, the entropy change of the universe. Delta S sub universe. I know, right? So guys, this takes into consideration the entropy change for both the system and the surroundings. The whole shooting match. If you'd like to see it in equation form, it looks like this. So guys, what does the second law of thermodynamics then say? You ready? Not yet? You're writing furiously. Can I show you? Not yet. So here's the idea. Rather, when we talk about ent or enthalpy, we just look at the system and we talk about energy being exchanged through heat. But guys, when we talk about entropy, we've got to look at the system and the surroundings. And it goes like this. You ready? In a reversible process. Remember, that's equilibrium, right? Whether you think about ice water at zero Celsius or as a human god is thinking about weak acids dissolving in water while protonating into water. Whatever it is you're thinking of, guys, here's the bottom line. For any reversible process, any process at equilibrium, the change in disorder of the universe is zero. So guys, make that make sense in your brain relative to a cup of ice water at zero degrees Celsius. Remember, we use that as our example of a reversible or equilibrium process. So picture your cup of ice water. Focus in on that boundary where the ice cube is touching the liquid water. Now put your mental picture into motion. And from what you're visualizing, why is the entropy of the universe not changing? Go ahead. And it's still making water. So guys, let's think about it. Here's my ice cube. My fist is the ice cube. Higher, low entropy. Relatively low. Here's water, higher or low at liquid water. Higher or low? High. Medium high. Okay. So when a water molecule hits the ice, it loses energy. What happens to that water molecule? Freezes. Where does the energy go? Into an ice molecule. What does it do? Melts. What's the net change in disorder? Zero. Because as you said, all the while we're making ice, we're making liquid water, and the net impact on the disorder of the universe is zero. Does that make sense? Okay. So now, guys, what about, and here order is conserved, right? Zero. But guys, what about processes that are spontaneous? And here's the bottom line. The disorder of the universe is going up. So what does that mean? Well, that, guys, means that order is not conserved. And so for any process that is spontaneous, the disorder of the universe is going up. There is not a law of conservation of disorder. There is not a finite amount of disorder in the universe, and we just move it around. 
unlike energy. There is a law of conservation of energy. That's the first law of thermo. But guys, in the universe, we have an unlimited supply of screwed up. And it just keeps going up. We will never get to the point where we will maximize screwed up. And guys, think about it in the context of our salt and sand or our salt and water video. You ready? So guys, here's our salt. Here comes the water. The water picks apart the salt. What is happening to the amount of entropy in the salt? Going up. What's happening to the amount of entropy in the water? It's going down, but those are not equal. This is not like energy where energy in equals energy out. They don't balance. Guys, with this and all other spontaneous processes, what do we know about the amount of disorder that the salt goes up compared to the amount of disorder the water goes down? Salt up is more. How do we know that? Because it happens. Guys, if it weren't the case, it wouldn't happen. So here's the thing we know for sure. Every spontaneous process causes an increase in disorder. So what about all the things that cause decreases in disorder? They don't happen because they're not spontaneous. Guys, there are billions of things in our universe that could be happening right now. They just don't because they're not spontaneous because they don't create an increase in disorder. It's always going up. Yep, so go ahead. Exactly. Exactly. So guys, let's bring this back to the quick cold pack. You ready? Why does this work? So we've got water and we've got ammonium nitrate. And guys, ammonium nitrate actually is organized as a crystal in salt. You can hear the pellets, but instead of NAs and CLs, it's NH4 ions, molecules, and uh, nitrate ions, again, in a crystalline lattice. Now, in order for, we know that this happens spontaneously, right? And we now know it's not because of, well, we know before it's not because of energy, because this is endothermic. So guys, why does this happen spontaneously? So it increases entropy. So when the, the ammonium nitrate dissolves into the water, it increases entropy. How do we know? Because it happens. But now the question is this, how much does the entropy go up? You ready? More than two things. More than the entropy of the water goes down and more than the energy that is absorbed. Get it? They are added together. Yeah. So guys, this is spontaneous because it creates a decrease in disorder and that decrease in dis... Oh, an increase in disorder. This works because it creates an increase in disorder and that increase in disorder is greater than both the decrease in disorder for the water and the amount of heat that is absorbed as this thing soaks in heat and feels cold. Yeah. There, yes, absolutely. And we are going to quantify entropy next time. Um, we, can, we can measure and do calculations with entropy. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, I'm always scared of only, always, and never. Because the minute you say that, you set yourself up for failure if there's one exception. So let's say usually, or tends to be. You learn to get vague in this class, right? And still sound smart. So let's go, let's go with usually or tends to be. All right. So guys, you okay? You feeling the entropy disorder coming together in your brain? All right. So guys, we are going to allow this to continue to be a concept for today.
Friday we will rewrite tests, and then guys, um, next week we'll get into the math of entropy, and then we will get into Gibbs free energy, where finally entropy and entropy come together, and we can finally define spontaneity for sure. So again, you already, you already got your homework, we've got about 20 to 25 minutes, I look forward to you guys working very, very industriously, industriously. So, I guess, so I guess that is done. And, and uh, then, then, guys, then on guys on day Monday, Monday, Monday Friday, Friday, we'll answer, we'll answer questions, questions might have, might relatives, have relatives, relatives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I saw, mean, I saw, 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 I saw,